Okay, um, thank you very much. So continuing the theme of how best to oxygenate a patient, I'm gonna talk about recruitment maneuvers um, both in the OR and the ICU. So um, these are my disclosures. And um, what is a recruitment maneuver? So essentially the, the um, function or the idea behind a recruitment maneuver is to reinflate or recruit collapsed lung by applying a high airway pressure. So we reopen the lung and we improve oxygenation and pulmonary mechanics. Now, if you look at that, um, you have to reopen or recruit lung. That means there is collapsed lung. So the need for recruitment maneuvers is actually usually a sign of inadequate PEEP. If you have adequate PEEP, if you're keeping the lung open, you probably won't need a recruitment maneuver. Having said that, there is a role for them. So it's traditionally used as part of an open lung approach. The benefit is unclear in the literature um, and um, perhaps should only be used in those recruitable patients, but how do we identify them? So um, there's, there are numerous papers describing use of recruitment maneuvers, some um, as an individual intervention and others as part of a combined ventilator strategy. So recruitment maneuvers in the operating room, um, not just because he's here. Um, this is um, Dr. Jaber's paper from, from uh, the New England Journal several years ago, describing a lung protective ventilation strategy versus a traditional ventilation strategy. So the traditional ventilation was high tidal volume, which was appropriate at the time. Um, no PEEP, no recruitment maneuvers. So those are patients who would clearly have lung collapse. The lung protective ventilation strategy, lower tidal volume, higher levels of PEEP, and intermittent recruitment maneuvers. So those were to 30 centimeters of water for 30 seconds after intubation and every 30 minutes thereafter. So what did they find? They found that they reduced um, major complications on day seven after surgery. That was a substantial reduction, and that, those, that reduction was maintained out to 30 days after the surgery. So, so um, this shows us that recruitment maneuvers may work in the operating room, but it's difficult to know because it's a combined strategy what the role of the recruitment maneuvers was versus the other elements, so lower tidal volume and higher PEEP. Now there's this other study, the ART study that came out in 2017. This was from Brazil, a, um, and this is an ICU study. So in this study, um, they set the PEEP based on the best compliance in the, in the intervention group, and they used lower, lower PEEPs in the control group. The intervention group got recruitment maneuvers to 45 centimeters of water, so substantially more aggressive recruitment maneuvers than in Dr. Jaber's study. That was reduced after about 500 patients in the trial because they had several patients who arrested during the recruitment maneuver. And we can see how that might happen, right? You over distend the lung, you keep it for, for a substantial amount of time, um, you can basically zero out the cardiac output. So those patients arrested. Um, there was a lot of hemodynamic instability and, and um, the effects of the recruitment maneuver may have contributed to this being a negative trial, or actually it was positive in the wrong way. It showed increased mortality with that strategy of higher PEEP and aggressive recruitment maneuvers. So this would indicate, again, difficult to separate the recruitment maneuvers from the other interventions, but this would indicate that recruitment maneuvers might not be beneficial. So where do we stand? How do we figure out how to deliver a better recruitment maneuver? And I'm gonna show you how um, this may be automated on your ventilator or on your anesthesia machine. So I'm gonna show a video of how we do an automated recruitment maneuver and point out some important um, aspects. So you can see this is, this is automated. The pressures here are 25 over five, so there is a um, 20 centimeter of water driving pressure. They're now setting the recruitment maneuver for 40 over 20 seconds, and they're setting the peep to increase at the end of the recruitment maneuver. So we're not gonna return to five of peep, we're gonna go back to eight of peep. And that's critical. If you're going back to the same peep, you're just gonna do it. 
crude again. So you can see there's no CO2 because we're delivering an extremely long inhalation. The pressure is a little delayed here, but you're going to see that's going to go up to 40 in a second. And um, right now the recruitment maneuver is being delivered. And there, there you can see the airway pressure is now dropping and we're getting a return to ventilation. So the peak airway pressure went up to 40 and now we're returning to our regular um, ventilation and you can see that that recruitment maneuver has dropped the driving pressure from 20 to 13. So obviously we recruited lung there, we improved the driving pressure and hopefully we improved that patient's lung mechanics. <clears throat> So um, this is a paper we published several years ago with my colleagues um, Elias Badorf cassis and Steve Loring, and we looked at why recruitment maneuvers may fail. And we utilized um, our EPVent1 database, and we looked at the delivered airway pressure during the recruitment maneuver, which was standardized in the study, and then we looked at the transpulmonary pressure of those patients, so the pressure actually distending the lung during the recruitment maneuver. Um, our method was to measure the elastance of the lung before the recruitment maneuver and then the elastance after the recruitment maneuver. If the elastance improved, that's a sign that we, um, that we um, improved the patient. So, so a, cha a negative change in elastance implied recruitment and a positive change, so the elastance increased, applied over distension. And we used, um, we were able to actually check the lung elastance because we had the esophageal balloon in or we're measuring transpulmonary pressure. So this is what it looked like. Everybody in the study got a recruitment maneuver to a, um, 40 centimeters of water. But the transpulmonary pressure here in red varied widely across patients. And you can see how it's distributed. So some patients had a very low transpulmonary pressure during the recruitment maneuver. Those are patients in whom that recruitment maneuver was likely inadequate. Others had a very high transpulmonary pressure, greater than 20. Nobody knows what a safe level is, but it's less than 20 for sure. So these are patients in whom the recruitment maneuver was really over distending the lung. And we showed that by an increase in, in elastance during, after the recruitment maneuver, so the elastance of the lung got worse in these patients. Okay, so anybody with a, um, with a positive, um, with a transpulmonary pressure of greater than 20 during the recruitment maneuver had a worsening elastance after the recruitment maneuver. So we over distended their lungs. On the other hand, patients who had no um, volume of recruitment, those were the patients with this lower transpulmonary pressure. So low is no good, you don't recruit anything. High is no good. We really need to target this golden zone in the middle where you um, increase the elastance, sorry, you decrease the elastance, improve the lung, and you increase the volume of recruitment. So targeting transpulmonary pressure during a recruitment maneuver may be a much better strategy than an arbitrary level of airway pressure. Can the phenotype of the patient help? Um, maybe. So you can see here in blue patients with intra-abdominal pathologies and um, patients here with other critical illness in the study. So patients with intra-abdominal pathologies um, had a lower transpulmonary, had a lower um, esophageal pressure, those, a lower transpulmonary pressure, and those patients probably would benefit from a recruitment maneuver. They would be more recruitable, less likely to over distend during the recruitment maneuver. Um, this is a larger cohort, so the EPVent1 study was 63 patients. This, is, um, this was a larger study, EPVent2. We had 200 patients. We were able to analyze 120. But the important message is the distribution was essentially the same. You have a tail of patients with a um, transpulmonary pressure greater than 20 during the recruitment maneuver, and you have a tail of patients with a transpulmonary pressure less than 10 unlikely to benefit from your recruitment maneuver. Please notice that we also changed the recruitment maneuver in this study. We went to 35 centimeters of water, not 40. <clears throat> what is the limit? Where, where do we begin to see 
um, less likelihood of improvement in, in the elastance of the lung. So once the transpulmonary pressure gets beyond 18, um, you begin to see a, a um, negative probability of improving lung elastance during the recruitment maneuver. So these are patients who are going to overdistend. So remember that number 18. That's about the transpulmonary pressure you want to reach in order to recruit as many patients as possible. So um, I'm going to finish by showing you a couple of slides of recruitment maneuvers guided by um, transpulmonary pressure. So this is a 28-year-old man with a motor vehicle crash. We were called to the bed for severe desaturations, um, sat in the 70s in spite of being on a PEEP of 18 and an FiO2 of 100%. So we um, performed the standard recruitment maneuver at BIDMC, that's 40 centimeters of water, and that resulted only really in a transient improvement of the SPO2 to the low 90s. And you can see here, um, we can measure the recruited volume, and we can see that the transpulmonary pressure generated during that recruitment maneuver was only 13. So, so <coughs> the... Um, what we had done here was to perform an inadequate recruitment maneuver. We weren't recruiting enough lung, and um, if we had been, done that based on the transpulmonary pressure, we might have done a better job. So we did it, <laughs> and we repeated the recruitment maneuver. Um, same, rec same recruitment maneuver, we went to 45 centimeters of water. That resulted in a peak transpulmonary pressure increase to 19. So not 13, we went to 19, which is about that limit that we talked about. Um, that increased the recruited volume um, from 200 to 350 cc's. And if you note here, um, this is the um, pressure volume curve of the lung itself. And you can see that the compliance of the lung is actually improving as we increase the volume. So it's going backwards as we increase the volume indicating that we're actually opening collapsed lung and improving the compliance. So after this recruitment maneuver, the patient had a sustained improvement in SpO2. We were able to, um, to uh, we had increased PEEP at the end, as I said you should, but we were able after that to begin to wean the FiO2. So this patient was essentially inadequately PEEPed, even though the set PEEP was 18. The recruitment maneuver helped us uncover that we were able to recruit volume, return to a higher level of PEEP, and um, make the patient better. So um, how do I summarize it? They may be useful both in the OR and the ICU. I wouldn't recommend using them routinely. The need for a recruitment maneuver is usually a sign of tidal derecruitment, so inadequate PEEP. And um, if we're going to do recruitment maneuvers, really you have to be increasing the PEEP at the end. Otherwise, you're just going to be repeating them every hour. Targeting airway pressure may lead to an inadequate or dangerous recruitment maneuver. Every ventilator in the world now measures transpulmonary pressure. Um, you can do that at the bedside. Um, at least consider it. So if you don't have an esophageal balloon, if you're not comfortable with the technology, one, I suggest you get comfortable. But if you don't, consider the patient's variables. So the patient's weight, um, is, the, is the patient obese? Is the patient um, have a large chest wall? Is it pushing down on the lung? Gender, um, so, so men with large bellies, women with large breasts pushing down on the chest wall. The position, is this patient now undergoing laparoscopic surgery and now is in deep Trendelenburg or even worse robotic surgery where they're essentially standing on their heads, um, the type of surgery. So all of these may affect how we, um, how we do a recruitment maneuver at the bedside. Be thoughtful. There is a, a place for it, but as part of a combined strategy and a good look at the patient themselves. Thank you very much.